show, we talk about bringing peace and calm into your life. Later in the show, we're going to be talking about mental health stigma. We're live at KCSB FM Santa Barbara 91.9. KCSB is a platform for cultural expression and thoughtful discussion. And we provide a diverse educational forum. And I'm a Santa Barbara-based clinical psychologist, and I specialize in pediatric neuropsychology. And during my clinical training and my current work, I've treated thousands of people. I want to share um, this information that I've had with you. I'm also a UCSB alumni, and I live locally in Santa Barbara. And this shows all about our community and how to create compassionate conversations about our well-being and health. Today on the show, we're talking about mental health and well-being with a focus on couples and family relations. And we have a very special guest, Dr. Lisa Firestone. Dr. Lisa Firestone is a clinical psychologist. Uh, She's also an author and the director of research and education for the Glendon Association. She studies suicide and violence as well as couples and family relations. An accomplished and much requested lecturer, she represents the Glendon Association at national and international conferences in the areas of suicide assessment and prevention, parenting, couple relations, and voice therapy. In collaboration with her dad, Dr. Robert Firestone, her studies resulted in the development of the Firestone Assessment of Self-Destructive Thoughts, also called FAST, and also the Firestone Assessment of Violent Thoughts, That's F-A-V-T. Dr. Firestone has published numerous professional articles and is the co-author with Robert Firestone and Joyce Catlett um, of Conquer Your Critical Inner Voice, as well as Creating a Life of Meaning and Compassion and Sex and Love and Intimate Relationships. Those are all um, APA books, American Psychological Association books. And also Dr. Firestone speaks frequently at conferences including the APA, the International Association of Forensic Psychology, the International Association of Suicide Prevention, um, the Department of Defense, and many others. She has also appeared in more than 300 radio, TV, and print interviews, including the BBC, um, CBS, NPR, the Los Angeles Times, Psychology Day, Men's Health, and O Magazine. It's a good list. I want to welcome you to the show, Dr. Firestone. Thank you, Deborah, for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And actually, um, Dr. Firestone and I were just talking, and I think this is a great topic for today, especially with Valentine's Day coming up. Although I didn't really plan it as such because I know Dr. Firestone, is she's an expert in many things. And in my mind, I was thinking suicide. But we're going to talk also, I think we're going to focus today on couples and family relations. So hopefully that will be something you'll enjoy listening to. Um, and I'd like to just talk a little bit about why we're talking about mental health. Um, I think mental health problems are one of the main causes of the overall um, disease burden worldwide. And mental health and behavioral problems are reported to be the primary drivers of disability worldwide. They cause over 40 million years, it says 40 million people um, that I guess that have disability and 20 to 29 year olds, which is a young age. Um, This is some research I found. And also major depression is thought to be the second leading cause of disability worldwide and a major contributor to the burden of suicide and ischemic heart disease. It's also estimated that one in six people, I think this number is actually higher than this number, but in the past week experienced a common mental health problem. I think we experience mental health problems all the time. Some are, you know, bigger and more challenging and some are easier, but I think they happen quite frequently. And also, I just um, like to share that mental health is the largest public health priority. Um, It's also the largest financial burden of any health issue in the world. And stigma and embarrassment are two of the top reasons why people with mental illness do not seek help or medication. Um, I also just like to reinforce that issues that surround mental health affect people from all walks of life. Um, So we're all... all, um, going to be having some kind of mental health issues at some point in our life. And then I just like to describe what mental health is. I think it's when we have a physiological balance, meaning kind of our heart and our brain and our nervous system and our thoughts feel very kind of peaceful and um, 
then outwardly we feel like we can kind of cope maybe more with the world. But it's really a, an ability to organize and integrate um, those two kind of our external world and our internal world. And I was wondering, um, Dr. Firestone, how you would describe mental health. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, even in getting trained in, in this field, you don't get a lot of courses about what is mental health. What you hear a lot about is what is mental illness or, you know, mental health problems, but not very little about what is mental health. And I think a mentally healthy person um, really is fully themselves. They're able to uh, know what they want and what matters to them in life and to pursue those things. Um, and they have access to their feelings, but they also can make decisions about their behavior. So it's important to be able to feel the full range of our feelings, mm -hmm. but it's also important to be make decisions about our behavior. Some of the times the way I describe it to people is your feelings are kind of like being on a roller coaster. They go through you. You don't get to choose mm -hmm. which way you're going to turn. Yeah. But your behavior is like driving a car. You can turn right or you can turn left or you can put on the brakes or you can speed up when you need to. And those decisions matter in terms of how we treat ourselves in a compassionate, kind way and how we treat other people in a compassionate and kind way. And those, I think, are signs of our mental health because when we're feeling good about ourselves, we also tend to be, first of all, more available to the people who care about us and better for them, mm -hmm. whether it's children if we have them or relationship partners if we have them or friends for that matter right right or even anyone that we're around i mean you know if we can't if we're not in tune with ourselves we're not going to be able to be in tune with other people and if we can't have that level of compassion for ourselves we're not going to even notice that right right and it's really important that we also treat other people well and respectfully but that would be part of mental health not separate from it yes I, well, I mean, I feel like everything's so intertwined that I feel like with physics that we're in the next 10 years, maybe they'll figure out some of these pieces that um, we're talking about. I did do a little research because I wanted to talk with you about mental health and then couples and family relations, since I know that's really your, um, one of your fortes. And um, I was just making a list of what makes a healthy relationship, too, with other people. I mean, I think there's the relationship we have with ourselves, which, like you're saying, we have to have that self-love and self-knowledge and awareness. And I love your idea of the roller coaster ride. I mean, I was trained more like with waves in the ocean, but I think it is like a roller coaster ride. And and the illusion that we can control it is, you know, like it almost be like an on off switch on the roller coaster ride, right? But we don't have that. Right. <laughs> um, and I think really um, signs of a healthy relationship are when two people develop a connection and it's based on mutual respect, trust, honesty, support, fairness, equality, um, separate identities. I know people sometimes get overlapping and get too involved with each other's lives, good communication, a sense of playfulness and fondness. I know um, um, John Gottlieb, is his name John Gottlieb? The, Gottlieb, who's like the kind of guru too on divorce and marriage. He has some great books on um, couples. He talks a lot about humor. Um, and I think all these things really take a lot of work. So um, we have to practice this. Um, I was wondering, um, as we're exploring this, um, jump to my, I was going to talk a little bit about stigma, but I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about couples. Um, I was wondering, how do you think um, mental health and couples and family relations intersect? I think they intersect a lot because I think that, you know, as human beings, I think we're very social creatures. Even those who are, of us who are more introverted want to be around other people. And we you know, it really matters the quality of our connections contribute a great deal to our mental health. And when something's off in our relationships, that also makes us feel pretty badly. So I think close interpersonal relationships are the source of a lot of pleasure and joy, but they're also a source of a lot of pain for a lot of people. And like you said, I think that, you know, close interpersonal relationships really do have to involve honesty and openness to feedback from your partner. Now, that doesn't mean you have to agree with your partner about everything, but that you look for the kernel of truth in their feedback rather than the, you know, flaws around the edges. <laughs> um, you know, that you really uh, do have care and respect for them as a separate person from yourself. They are not a part of you. When you get that merged identity, it actually really hurts the romantic relationship because you start to, you know, replace the real kind relating with a fantasy of being merged. And that, when you start using the other person for protection or think of them as a part of you, and also that's when the sexual attraction or spark 
dies out if you do that. If you don't do that, if you stay being two separate people with your own individual identity, strong sense of that, but you're able to link, then you can really keep a relationship romantically alive for, you know, a, a lifetime. Right. I, I like to tell couples, I don't know if you agree with me on this, but I mean, and also just in relationships, it's kind of like building a house. And I think sometimes we, we need a really strong foundation um, to build from. So if our relationship starts out and we have these pieces in in place, you know, where we're like a whole person and we're taking care of ourselves and our health and our mental health and our physical health. And then we meet somebody else and they're kind of a whole person versus the idea. I think a lot of us grew up with the idea like I'm half a circle and I'm going to meet somebody else and they're going to be half a circle and that's going to complete me. And I think I like the idea of more that you, if you can help take care of yourself and become a more complete person, then right, then you don't have, I guess what you're saying is also it really impacts the, the ability to have an open sexual relationship and also overcome maybe conflict? Is that what you're getting yeah, at? Yeah, and also to have, you know, boundaries of that, you know, your something lights up your partner might not be what lights you up and to support their independence in that and for them to support you in that. Um, you know, but you have to see them as a separate person and you have to see them, you know, in a compassionate light but a realistic light. So you've got to embrace them with all of their good and bad traits. If you get into a relationship thinking you're going to change the other person mm, yeah. or you're going to make them whole or they're going to make you whole, right? first of all, is the idea that somehow you're broken and not a whole person without them. And, you know, what we're attracted to is another whole person is attracted to us as another whole person. And so we need to keep that sense of separate identity that can link. So we can be very close. We can share a lot. But we're two separate people with two sovereign minds that are informed by all the things that happened to us before we even met each other. Right. Um, and a lot of it has to do with our very early relationships because the model we get for how relationships go, for how to think about myself in relationship, how to think about other people in relationships, and also how I can expect to get treated by others, how I should treat others, really come from our very earliest relationships. We develop what John Bowlby, who was the founder of the field of attachment theory, calls internal working models, or ideas about how relationships are going to go. Mm -hmm. And then we take them out to the world, and it turns out, for instance, if you have security as a child and feel, uh, have a good enough parent... <laughs> because there are no perfect parents, but good enough. Mm -hmm. What you learn is that, you know, people are going to be there for you most of the time. And when they get it wrong, they're probably going to fix it, and it's all going to work out. And when you're like that, it turns out your peers like you better, your teachers like you better, your relationships go better as an adult. So, wow, you know, how do we, first of all, figure out exactly what did happen to us, yep. make sense of it, and really work on repairing that so we can have healthier relationships as adults. And that's something I've been very passionate about. Uh, actually developed an, e an online course that people can take about that with Dr. Dan Siegel, who's a leader in the field of interpersonal neurobiology and an attachment researcher. And we really walk people through identifying those messages they got early on and those feelings they developed about themselves and what they internalized about how relationships go and how to work on that depending on what type of attachment you form. Because, you know, as children, as babies, you know, our job is to figure out the social world we're born into, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Who are those adults and how do I get them to take care of me? <laughs> and the adaptations we make to get our needs met from the time we're very little are adaptations we tend to carry with us throughout our life. Now, sometimes they were absolutely the best idea in our family of origin, mm -hmm. but they're not working for us so well in our adult relationships. <laughs> right. And that's when we have to challenge them. Yep. Yep. You said a lot of good information there. I think um, what you're talking about, too, is um, when I like what Dr. Firestone brought up about the idea like you don't have to be a perfect parent. And that comes from actually Sigmund Freud, who had a, a student named W.R. Beyond. I just know this because I study these people. And I love that quote. And he, the quote actually says, you don't have to be a perfect mother. You have to be a good enough mother. So just and also there really is no perfection. So just try to achieve somewhere in the middle that's moderate. Right. And it's also <clears throat> about repairing the times that there's ruptures. Right. That actually builds resilience. You know, if you had this perfect parent that never, there was never a rupture, you know, you wouldn't really be trained for dealing with that. And it's going to happen in the real world. I think we are living in a culture, though, where that is a very valid point and a big point, actually, where we don't want to have any kind of conflict. I, I mean, what I try to teach my patients is actually, and I do this in my own life, too, is to welcome the things that are most uh, bothersome or I fear the most or 
um, that maybe I failed at because really failures, quote unquote failures are ways to like, you know, or ruptures, however you want to say that. Um, I think those are opportunities for growth and evolution and change. But if we don't ever have the awareness that they even happened. And I like you said that you and Dr. Siegel have created this kind of format. I know just today in my practice, I was going through with someone and we were talking about what type of attachment they had. And I said, well, do you know about that? And they didn't really know too much. And I just explained, you know, they're secure, anxious, avoidant, and ambivalent. Um, but, you know, it's hard to identify unless you have someone kind of walking you through that. So maybe, is that like a guided program or something? Yeah, it is. Can... It's actually an online course through our website, psychalive.org, which has just a lot of good, healthy information yeah. about psychology, whether it's being alive to yourself, alive to your romantic relationships, or alive to being a parent. Um, but, you know, it really walks people through what those attachment styles look like. And Dan and I actually role play them. Nice. Um, and kind of what the child internalizes. And then we also role play what it looks like when in your romantic relationships mm. and how that plays out. So people really can get kind of a visual and it's something they can work through at their own pace. We have exercises for people to do that help them identify their attachment pattern as well. And also to resolve any unresolved trauma. Because, you know, we think about trauma as, you know, big, terrible things that happen to people. Right. And we like to think none of those happen to us. <laughs> um, and, you know, the reality is that they're not just the big, huge things, but anything that changes how we see ourselves, other people, or the world is traumatic. So there's lots of little T trauma. Exactly. You know, things that aren't as huge, but that really did shape how we feel about things. And that really matters. So we can identify those. And any ones that are unresolved are the problem. So, you know, trauma is most problematic when it's not resolved and not right. worked through. Right. And so, so it accumulates. It just keeps it compounding. It accumulates <laughs> and it causes these radiating effects. If you can identify what those traumas were and work through them and make a coherent story about them, mm -hmm. it really does help to have them not be troubling you and shadowing you and you know coming out in the way you relate in because in essence unresolved trauma we tend to recreate throughout our lives right we just it's we, yeah we recreate it in different ways that may not be the same way that it was created in the first place and then it seems like it's different but it's just kind of it's like a symptom of what's really the underlying piece there absolutely and I, I think trauma is a really hot topic and I actually did a lot of my research at UCLA Medical School on trauma too and I think that um you know, trauma really is accumulative. And I think people think, oh, well, I, I didn't really have any trauma. But like you're saying, I mean, everybody has had trauma of some type. I also like the idea like that I think we're all wired a little differently. Like some people, like a thermostat, you know, that you turn your heat and cold up and down. I think some of us are wired just by birth through, you know, I'm genetics, maybe in utero, lots of different factors that we probably don't even have the information on that we maybe are predisposition to be more sensitive to trauma but other people maybe it doesn't impact them as much maybe they're able to regulate themselves a little bit differently right and it partly depends a lot on our early attachments because that's what teaches us how to regulate our emotions right Did <laughs> so you, yeah we do need a parent who could do that for us from the outside which is super hard yeah and <laughs> and they don't have to be perfect but they right. get it right enough and they can do it enough for themselves that we learn how to do that and we internalize that yeah. If we haven't, there's lots of ways we can get those skills. So it's not like, oh, you didn't get them, so too bad. No, we can get them and acquire them later in life, right. too. Right. And they're really important because they help us feel better. And, yeah, we have different – the way Dan Siegel talks about it is um, – a window of sensitivity mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know some people have a very narrow window so they're <laughs> kind of through it before they see it coming yeah and that's what you're talking about in terms of like very sensitive yep um if you have a wide window you can kind of see it coming and you can do things to calm it down right but you can stretch out and widen that window mm -hmm. for a kid and if you're a good enough parent you can do that even with a kid who's wired like that um if you've been able to do it for yourself um that would mean which i think what you're saying but you correct me if i'm wrong I think what Dr. Firestone is saying when she says, if you can do it for yourself, just because I know I try to do this with my 12-year-old, is you're going to feel yourself get dysregulated. You're going to feel your thoughts maybe becoming racy. You might feel agitated. Your heart might start racing. You might feel like really upset. And then that's usually when we lash out at our kids. So a different way of maybe doing that would be to think about what that child's experiencing and how maybe you're experiencing something similar and then to resolve that, to be present for the child and help them work through their dysregulation and be present for them and not fragmented. 
Right. And, and, and one of the ways you can do that is, you know, to do something rhythmical that'll calm down your brain. Mm -hmm. So paying attention to your breathing for a few minutes can help, uh, yeah. you know, taking a walk before you talk to your child about something really upsetting. Or even going in the bathroom, like for just walk. I tell people, you know, go in the bathroom, wash your hands. You know, you let the child know I'm going to go wash my hands and I'll be back. I do that myself, by the way. Yeah. And, and just take in a couple breaths. Just remember you're a loving person and you're doing the best you can and, you know, and regroup yourself. You kind of, I think you have to recalibrate kind of. Well, right? you're actually getting the higher functions of your brain back online, <laughs> which you'd like to have when you're communicating even about something difficult. For sure. Yeah. You know, and so I think that's really important. And what you said about people not knowing they have trauma is, is I think, really true. One of the things that came out when we were doing the uh, e-course uh, was that uh, Dan told a story about when he got training in a particular kind of therapy that's for trauma. And uh, when he was in the training, they said, well, come up with a trauma because they wanted them to kind of experience what it was like and take turns helping each other, you know, in the course. Um, so they got some real experience of it. Mm -hmm. Best way to learn. Yeah. And he said, uh, don't have any trauma. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> and they said, no, no, come up with something. Everybody has some trauma. And what he came up with is a story about when his dog died when he was uh, a young boy uh, and how he felt responsible for that. And um, it's so interesting because I've heard Dan tell this story, uh, having been in one of his study groups uh, starting about 15 years ago. I've heard many, many different versions of this story now. Of the dog with the Of trauma. the dog yeah. story. And it really has morphed in various ways his understanding of it because each time he realizes part of it's not resolved, he goes back into therapy. Yeah. Um, and partly, you know, it's the beliefs that taught him about himself. And one of those beliefs was that things he did could cause harm to others. So he became very hypervigilant. Right. And That's still, what trauma... Yeah. And then, you know, still to this day... I was walking down a beach with him uh, on vacation last year, and he wanted to put sunblock on every person on that beach. You know, I mean, he still has that hypervigilance for danger, and um, it was just interesting to see, you know. Yeah, um, how it manifests. Mm -hmm. How it manifests in this overly helpful behavior, which might actually feel <laughs> intrusive to some people. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to see how that developed and how it's played out as in his personality. So yep. we have these things. We may not understand their origins mm -hmm. and how they're affecting us, sometimes for good, like being extra careful about things isn't always bad, especially if you're a doctor. Um, you would like our doctors to be a bit careful and, and a little hypervigilant for danger. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> but... On the other hand, it caused him to be that way with his kids, and they really resent it. And they probably have hypervigilance about those things, too. And they have anger and resentment at their dad for always sort of hovering yeah. and worrying. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, finally, at one point, his daughter said, you know, hey, get a grip, man. You know, when your daughter says that to you, you kind of go, okay, I got to do something well, about Well, I mean, this. I think that's an important, <clears throat> I'm actually writing a book on, I'm turning my research into a book, so Shambhala's approach to be my research, and it's going to be not, it's going to take me another year or two to get it done, so I'm just going to give you my idea. But, I mean, I think that what you're saying is that the, that walking down the beach because of this trauma that he had that was unresolved, it kind of not only impacted him and him, like, becoming too invasive with the people on the beach and maybe not being aware of that, but then his kids gave him feedback, and that was kind of a light bulb idea for him. So he was receptive to that from the kids. And, I mean, I think that's a really important point for me. I love to listen to my son. I mean, it's hard sometimes. I mean, he doesn't always say things that I would necessarily agree with, but, you know, maybe he has ideas that would help me match him. Um, there's been a finding, too, that's been repeated over and over again with kids, too, is that children do know what path to follow toward healing, but also we have to listen to them. Um, I think the other piece too, that because you were talking about development and babies and all that is that, you know, our personality, like 50% of our personalities developed by the time we're two and 75% by the time we're three. So when you think of your baby, it is really a baby. The babies are beautifully cute, but just remember that baby is so smart. It just doesn't have the language. So anyhow, I mean, you know, you kind of, I think what we're ultimately both talking about is retracing your steps and being honest about, you know, what traumas you've had because in your relationships, whether it's romantic or with your kids or in your life, um, that will come out in different ways. Is right. that kind of what we're both talking about? Yeah, and there and, and it's unresolved, you know, unresolved trauma leaves us with lots of triggers. So things our child does like, uh, you know, defy us or, you yeah. know, confront us or whatever 
or, you know, um, just being in a bad mood or, you know, might trigger things in us that weren't resolved from our own childhood. Sure. Yeah. And our romantic partners do this too, right? We, you know, they, we let them in the closest and put to some degree, our well-being in their hands. Yep. And so that makes us very vulnerable to them. And, you know, in that, they can trigger us. So, And when one partner gets triggered, it often triggers the other partner. And this is when things can escalate with lashing back and forth, saying a lot of really hurtful things <clears throat> that may not even be what you really feel. I mean, yes, you feel them in that second, but they might not be your overall evaluation of the other person. And what happens is then you're kind of off to the races and then you've got a real mess on your hands because there's been a lot of hurt. Right, and, and also, yeah. It, yeah. And if you can de-escalate all that, you know, think about it. You can have a much better relationship where you can talk about things rather than be in an emotional triggered state. Exactly. I mean, it kind of reminds me of stigma in a way because I think we can internalize that too. You know, if we have a partner that's coming at us and we already have traumas um, and, and maybe it's not even accurate, um, we might take that on and actually become discriminatory towards ourselves for those ideas, even though maybe it's just a moment of a heated argument. So, right. um, I mean, I mostly, I, I do still like to talk about stigma because I feel like there's a stigma about talking about what we're talking about, right? A little bit, just trauma, um, couples and problems. I mean, I think there's no perfect relationship or perfect person. So, I mean, that's why I like compassion too, because I just think, um, you know, we can get very fear-based too. We can have misconceptions and then and then we kind of become more isolated and, and withdraw from our partners and our friends. Right. We I think we have to be careful about that. And I think, you know, myths like the idea that we have a soulmate or that there's some Prince Charming that's going to come, you know, waltz into our life or some princess who's going to be perfect. Right. You know, the reality is there isn't. You exactly. know, there's good enough partners where there's enough of a fit mm -hmm. and where you can talk about the stuff that's difficult and where you can grow together. And, you know, it's a process. And sometimes your partner is going to be going through a hard thing. Sometimes you're going to be going through something hard. Right. And, you know, that knowing that those are part of life and that there is no perfect partner. If it was the perfect partner, there'd be no problem. No, that's just not There's true. There's always going to be. Actually, the problems, though, can be, like I was saying before, those can be opportunities. Um, but we usually kind of shirk away from, from that. That's true. <laughs> right. And I, I think we do need to approach them and deal with them and talk about the things that are hard. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of people come talk to me and they talk about, you know, some problem with their partner, but they haven't even brought it up. That's true. To that person and actually, or talk to them. I was thinking about how I see a lot of young adults and I like to teach them about, well, first, just like loving themselves and being whole themselves. But I think diffusing that myth of like, we grow up, we get married, we have kids, we have a white picket fence. Because like I know in college, I worked at Cornerstone House, which is like, I don't know if you remember Cornerstone, I, are they still, they're a home in Montecito. They used to have two houses and there's like six kids that live at the home and they have multiple disabilities like cerebral palsy and blindness or, you know, they have multiple things going on. So they live at the home. And I remember one of the things I got trained on that has stuck with me forever is the idea that I had to help those parents um, we did all these trainings because we had to learn how to talk to the parents because the parents have that idea like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I got married, I have this beautiful home and I have this child, but we don't think, oh, and I might have a child that has a disability or I might marry someone who's not perfect, you know? So I think we have to become a little more accurate in the way that we look at maybe relationships too and our relationship with ourselves. <laughs> right. And, and like you said, throughout all of that, compassion is really important. Because if you think you're supposed to have, you know, get married, have children, and live happily ever after, and, it's, you know, then in a way, you're set up for disappointment and frustration and feeling like a failure when those things don't work out that way. And I worked with parents who had kids with disabilities as well, and, you know, there's often a feeling of this was a major, you know, it means something terrible about me. I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm being punished. Yeah. It's not about that. Right. You know, and, you know, it's accepting and learning and, and finding the gift, even in a difficult situation. Right. I mean, I think that that does relate to stigma because I think we have these ideas that um, stem from misinformation and negative attitudes that are are not really accurate. So, I mean, that's why I like to do this show because maybe we, we diffuse some of that idea. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to talk for a couple more minutes and maybe a minute or so, and then I'm going to take a quick break and then we'll come back on. Um, I was wondering if you, Dr. Firestone, could explain how couples and family relations 
um, like I know you were explaining some of the, the different exercises people could do in workshops. When you work with couples and families, how do you work with them so that they can understand the foundation or concepts as it may relate to them? I mean, just right. in a general, I know you, it's, sure. it's, a, it's a short You show. know, I mean, I do it in different ways. I mean, one thing is I do often do uh, the adult attach, attachment interview, which is a um, an interview for asking people about their childhood in kind of a different way um, that helps people get more of a, you know, stepping back perspective on what it was like for them growing up. And if you do this with a couple with each of the, with their partner in the room, the partner's not allowed to say anything. They're not, they don't chime in about your mother or your father or your early childhood. They're just there to listen. Mm -hmm. They learn a lot of things about you and you learn a lot of things about them. And so that's helpful for people. Mm -hmm. And that helps people get a lot more compassion for yeah. their partner. Yeah. I um, like that. And understands how some of their dynamics kind of fit together. I also work with people about on uh, communication. Yeah. And how to have more collaborative communication where you actually sit, make eye contact, put away your devices and look at one another and try to understand what's going on from the other person's perspective. Yeah. Realizing that they may have seen it very differently from you. Find out there's not usually somebody who's right and somebody who's wrong uh, in most couples' <laughs> disagreements. Yeah. Well, no, that they're both seeing a different reality partly based on their past. Right. Their perspective is based on their right. experiences. Yeah. And so that when they can see that, then you can do more to align their states and are they really on the same side about what they want the outcome to be, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, that they usually can get behind. They want to be close. They both want to be heard and respected. They both want to provide that to each other. It's the fact that they may have trouble doing it for various reasons or even understanding what that would look like for various reasons. Right. Yeah, it's hard to imagine that. I like that, though. So you do this adult, adult attachment interview and then you kind of have one person listen and hear the other person and without saying anything or judging it or anything. How do you think, um, I know with couples, my experience with couples, it seems like there's already so many scripts or stories that we've created. And so it's very set, you know, and, and I think that, you know, when we go to therapy, we do have the opportunity to have, you know, new experiences. They call that the corrective emotional experience. But I think also when you're sitting with someone and one person can't talk and one person can, that must be real. I was just curious. Do you ever ask the person who's not talking if they're really listening or if, they, or if they're defragmented or they're not you know, present? Well, we, we, we talk about it afterwards, you know, with yeah. both of them getting a chance to talk. And then we do it the opposite direction. So both people are going to get a chance to do this. Yeah. Um, and I find that they're often reflecting on themselves, too, and their history because they're thinking mm -hmm. about, how am I going to answer these questions? Right, they're and, a little distracted. Yeah, you know, they're a little distracted, but they're also really hearing things about their partner, sometimes for the first time, that they may have never known. Um, and I think that's really helpful, and it builds closeness, actually, and understanding and compassion. You know, I also work with people on thinking about the negative messages that they have toward themselves, but also toward their partner, critical inner voices, and, you know, understanding where the source of those is back in, uh, also often in early experiences. And that really helps partners, you know, feel less judged and feel more compassion. And, you know, it's really trying to increase their compassion toward themselves and toward their partners. Right. I think you really have to have that compassion toward yourself because, I mean, how if you don't have that, it's going to be challenging, right? Mm-hmm. So. Very much so. Um, okay, I think we're going to take a quick break. We have about 20 minutes left, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk a little more about couples and family relations. And also, we're just talking about couples um, and attachment, um, self-compassion, and some um, biology, a little bit about, you know, the neurobiology of how this maybe affects us as babies. So um, we'll be right back in a minute. And I'm going to play physics talk for you. Light and merge. The disruption they cause in space-time is so large it can be felt on Earth. On Wednesday, February 20th at 6 p.m., postdoctoral scholar Isabel Garcia Garcia will be presenting findings about black holes, both classical and quantum. This event is hosted by UCSB's Cavi Institute of Theoretical Physics as part of their Physics Cafe program held at Soho Restaurant and Music Club. More information can be found at www.kitp.ucsb.edu slash outreach slash cafe dash kitp. Hi, welcome back to the Dr. Deborah Show. We're live here at KCSB FM 91.9. And 
we are talking today with Dr. Lisa Firestone um, about couples and family relations. And Dr. Firestone um, studies suicide and violence as well as couples and family relations. And she also has created, um, she's done many studies and she's developed the Firestone Assessment of Self-Destructive Thoughts and the Firestone Assessment of Violent Thoughts. She's also published numerous professional articles and is the co-author of Conquer Your Critical Inner Voice, as well as Creating a Life of Meaning and Compassion and Sex and Love in Intimate Relationships. Um, And Dr. Firestone speaks frequently at conferences Um, She also has appeared in more than 300 radio shows, TV, and print interviews, including the BBC, CBC, NPR, the Los Angeles Times, Psychology Today, Men's Health, and O Magazine. That's a good list. So welcome um, to the show again, Dr. Firestone. And we were just talking before the break um, about um, couples and family relations. And we were just um, kind of talking about attachment and um, she, Dr. Firestone was explaining that um, on her, the website, which is PsychoLive, is that what you said? Mm-hmm. Which actually, PsychoLive.org. Check out, it is a nice website. You've got some good um, things on there. That there's something called the adult attachment interview and it kind of guides you through, um, right? Is that what you were explaining? Like what yeah. your attachment style is. So if you're interested in it, I think that's kind of an important thing actually to really know. Um, I was wondering, like, how do you think that your work in, like, the couples and family relations field has, like, accepted or rejected mental health stigma? Well, I think it's, I think it's really important to address mental health stigma because I think the biggest thing that stigma does is it keeps people from going for help, um, whether it's working on your relationship or working on just something about yourself or something you're struggling with, it's really important for people to know that it's okay to go for help. And, you know, I think we have two problems in, in our country, anyhow. We have the problem of the stigma of going for help and what will your friends think or what will your family think or is it okay right. or what will your partner think or whatever it might be. But there's also the fact that, you know, there's a lack of access to, resources, you know, resources right. and availability of mm-hmm. mental health treatment. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, we do live in a community here in Santa Barbara where there are a lot of therapists and there are people available. And there are even low-cost counseling options available, but not everybody knows how to access them or how to get to them. And, you know, I think that's really important. And and more and more people are looking for mental health help on the Internet. Yeah, it's It's, become popular. Actually, all the magazines, people, it's like, it seems to be a trendy thing, which I'm happy about. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And and just because at least more information is out there for people and a lot of good information. And that's part of why we developed Psych Alive, because we want to make this uh, information, the webinars and the e-courses we do and all of the blogs available to people all over, you know. And um, it's interesting that we get for our webinars people from countries all over the world. So that's one thing about getting on the Internet is you reach people you know, outside of even who you thought you were going to reach. And, you know, our whole focus is on destigmatizing mental health and providing people with ways to work on their mental health or address mental health issues so they can feel better and have more satisfying lives. Yeah, there's a lot of great resources on there. And I think um, I also am just a big proponent of the media and just try, I'm always trying to get the media. I'm hoping to have, I had Glenn Phillips on last week. We have some other people that are going to come in that are in that that realm. But I just think it's so important for people to realize that those people that are famous or, you know, have these high profile jobs, um, it doesn't necessarily mean your mental health any better. Right. I mean, I think we have to decipher what we see on the on the TV show. I don't have TV, so I don't really know. But I know what TV is. And I think we a lot of us watch TV and we look to media. Right. And not just the Internet, like what your website yeah. has. But. What? Do, how do you think the mass media? How, I mean, I under, appreciate the fact you have your website, and that is a good start. And I know there's no. It is a resources. good start, and there are good mental health resources out there um, I was on the, the internet. Media. But there's also some that aren't wonderful, and there's media betrayals of mental health issues and therapy that are really helpful, um, and there's ones that are really unhelpful and stigmatizing. So it really matters how things are portrayed, and I think the biggest thing is telling people a) there's hope. B, there's nothing to feel bad about, and it's important to get the help you need. One thing I thought that was very positive that I saw recently was um, on the Grammy Awards, uh, when Lady Gaga accepted her award for her song, 
and for the song that's in a movie that definitely deals to some degree with mental health issues. Yep, she's a big mental health stigma proponent. Very much, <laughs> and a stigma buster. And she talks about her own mental health struggles. She's actually part, I've talked to her about her on my show because she's like on the Hague Committee. She's part of the United Nations Committee. She's really taken a strong stance on this. But Right, and um, she struggled with her own mental health issues, so she's very sensitive about it. Right. Very clued in to how people feel excluded and different mm -hmm. and put down for things that they, you know, about themselves and how that makes people feel about themselves. And, you know, I, I like her messages because they're about getting help and getting, you know, and that there's hope. Yep. You know, those things really do matter. They convey a lot to people. And, you know, these are people people look up to. And we like to think, you know, they're the perfect human being. Well, the perfect human being has mental health problems, too. That's the reality. Exactly. And here's how you can get help. And please access it. It's good for you. And, you know, I think it does matter when people who have celebrity status for whatever reason. Um, you know, I think this about uh, both Prince Harry and uh, mm -hmm. his brother in... Um, you know, and William in, in England, they've really adopted mental health as a cause. Right. And they, you know, talk about, you know, mental health issues. And I think that's so important. And they have celebrity status for, you know, the they reason do. that and people they're doing, they're doing a great job. Look up to royalty and those you know, when when people in those positions handle it responsibly, I think it actually helps a lot of people. Well they're doing a beautiful job I think because of their mom the relationship with their mother. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I actually saw when I was looking I, that they were just um discussing why British people <laughs> have uh, more mental health problems was the title of the article, I think. But I mean, it doesn't mean that they have more mental health problems, but I think that what the point they were talking about is why they aren't talking about mental health problems. So I think they're trying to instigate that kind of like, right. I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to get people yeah. to talk about this more. And, um, and they're using their own life experience of losing their mother at an early age, right? you know, to talk about what loss is like. And there's plenty of people who experience loss you know, and uh, how important that is and that it's okay to talk about that it doesn't just go swimmingly when you have to deal with things like that at an early age. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, when in my practice, like I sometimes someone will come in and one week they're like, oh, my gosh, I feel completely hopeless. And my couple, my marriage is it's not happening. And, and you know, it's devastating. But then we do some work and we talk about really maybe the more uncomfortable things. And thresh through it you know in psychology they call that working through you know you kind of work through it and maybe you come to a different place and space so you're more receptive to meet your partner and then it's interesting like the next week they'll come that person might come back and feel totally better but what i try to do is always remind them like there will be another time it's like you talked about the roller coaster right or waves in the ocean right there's going to be another wave of something that happens or another uh, unfortunately, life has tragedies and ups and downs. Absolutely. And that's what resilience is, is learning to deal with the ups and downs. Right. You know? I think resilience is another like really hot term. And I think you did a great job of explaining how that gets built, you know, really developmentally too, um, you know, at a very young age. Um, Dr. Firestone, I was wondering, how do you feel that a person receiving support from like a couples and family relations support person um could get could help a person through like a mental health crisis yeah I, I think the biggest thing is is being present for somebody and really listening to them when they're in mental health crises and really um trying to empathize fully with the pain they're experiencing you know people want to feel heard <laughs> think about when you've been in your own crises right you know you want to feel heard and when somebody can hear your pain and sit with you in your pain you start to feel a lot better Yep. You feel joined and you feel like you're not alone in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the reality is in most crises, people turn to their friends. That's true. <laughs> not always a professional. <laughs> yep. But even with professionals, what they really want is to be heard, to be understood, not to be talked out of their feelings or just, you know, do this. It'll cheer you up, you know, or you'll feel better if you do this. What they really want to do is to be heard and for somebody to play back to them what they're hearing. And to offer a sense of hope that things will get better, like you said. Mm -hmm. You know, so when somebody's in their dip, to recognize, yeah, I'm here right now. But, you know, last week you weren't here. Mm -hmm. So I was talking to somebody I'm working with who's got, you know, very severe depression at times and has struggled with this for a long time, even though she's quite young. And it's really important because sometimes she's just a, you know, a fireball and has lots of energy and lots of passion for mental health treatment, actually and for helping people in distress. 
And she's a great ally to lots of people and has been very helpful in various roles um, in terms of her profession. But when she's in that low place herself, it's very hard to see or access that there's these other parts of her that are quite strong. Right. Well, we can. I look at it kind of like quite a, valuable, like a vortex in the tub. When you let the water down, you know, the drain it kind of sucks you in. That's why it's so important to like pause. I think. I mean, I know I've suffered with depression my whole. That's you know. But I think we all have depression, anxiety. But that's probably if I were to have something. I. But for me. I think what really helps is like what you're talking about is, you know, one to just step away and take some breaths and remember, you know, that I'm here on the earth. And also, I think um, I, I think that this illusion like that we're not going to have depression. I, I don't know. That's kind of <laughs> another tall topic. But um, but really that there's these other parts of who I am, you know, th mm -hmm. that I can be. A, I, I like what James Hillman, because I got trained by James Hillman. I don't know if you ever met him when he used to come here. But he always talked about depression as something that's juicy. Like he would take out a Shakespeare book from whatever. I don't remember the year of Shakespeare. He was like an original tattered book. And he would read a character description. Um, and it was a way of training actually doctors to do their case notes, which I thought was really great because really it's that person's journey. Like it's not for me. It's the same thing I think you're talking about with listening to, to a friend is you don't have to tell them what to do. You don't have to have the answer or, you know, give them the pat on the back, although some people like affection. But I think there doesn't have to be a right answer, just more listening. And also maybe even if you reminded, I guess, that person of what we're talking about, the other parts of who they are, because everything's in flux and changing. and We're not just one thing. You know? Right. And depression is different for everybody. Like I know James Hillman talked about, like, does it feel like a cloud's following you? Does it feel like you want to stay in bed all day in your pajamas? Do you feel like eating mashed potatoes? You know, make it more descriptive because mm -hmm. then you can also address that and maybe meet that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, yeah, actually, everybody's an expert on their own situation. And we got to remember that. That's true. <laughs> we shouldn't be talking down to them yes. about what they're experiencing, no I matter what that. it is. Yeah. You know, and... And then we, you know, it's really drawing on that, you know, where are their strengths and what are the things that work for them, you know, and help mm -hmm. them feel better. Mm -hmm. And that's really different. We can't prescribe that. It's kind of like meaning in life, which is a very important thing to have for getting through the rough spots yeah. in life. But, you know, there's not one meaning in life and you find it and then you have it. Know. My you son know, asked me that the other day. So that's the only reason I was smiling at you. He yeah. said, Mom, what's the meaning of life? I thought, well, that's a good question. Let's talk yeah. about that. Let's talk about it. What lights you up? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What kind of things would make your life feel more valuable to do? Yeah. And, you know, it might have to do with travel and adventure. It might have to do with doing volunteer work and helping other people right we all have our own meaning in a way we have our own meaning but if we don't have that we have a lot of trouble so it's finding like that compass. is kind of important because without that we're kind of like a ship without a rudder you know mm -hmm. or sometimes we do know what it is but we don't make much time for it mm -hmm. you know in all the busyness in our life and the quotes things we have to do you know whether that's you know work and school and kids and relationship partners and blah 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 we forget we don't always give enough time and attention to the things that light us up. And when we neglect that, we're not only not feeling as well ourselves, but we're not, we don't have that much to offer the other people in our lives either. So it's really important that we find, figure out what that meaning is. And it's not like one thing. It may morph over your lifetime too, right? Mm -hmm. So what was really important and lit you up when you were 10 might be very different than when you were 20 <laughs> right. or when you're 30 or whatever, you know? So it's not that it's this fixed thing either, but it can really take other forms. But it's important. So sometimes you discover something that lights you up. Like, you know, I was never a person who played a lot of sports or did a lot of things that were very physical. I lack hand-eye coordination. But I found that I really love hiking and being in the outdoors and I it actually calms me and I just light up it makes me happy puts a smile on my I face I think hiking is good for everybody right yeah but see if you do that then you get really you know do those things that really light you up like that you come back from that you're gonna have more to offer everybody in your life it's true I just think people who get depressed or feel down um especially like you know if they're in a relationship and then they feel down they tend to either lose momentum or they have a hard time getting to the place. Like, you know, once you get to a place, sometimes that's easier. Yeah. So I think though, also just being gentle with yourself um, and each other um, be, and, and, all, and creating space is really healthy too because we can come become very reactive with each other. And it feels like, I think of it like a, almost feels like a boxing match a little bit, you know, and just kind of take a break um, and, and have some space. Right. And, 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 and calm ourselves down mm -hmm. by doing something 
that's predictable and rhythmical. So, you know, be paying attention to your breathing because when you breathe in, you're mm-hmm. going to breathe out. Yeah, I like predictable and rhythmical. And when you breathe yeah. out, mm-hmm. you're going to breathe in. Mm-hmm. You know, going for a run, when you pick up one foot, you're going to put down the other. When you pick up the other foot, you're going to put down the other. You know, that actually helps your brain higher functions get back online when you've been triggered and you're upset even washing like i for years have been telling patients to go wash their like because i had this office and i get these soaps and i'm like why don't you go wash it you know like if you just really smell the soap and you feel the water because the buddhists they're really into the water you know like noticing the water dripping and um i think that now there's a lot of studies coming out actually about you release a lot of good chemicals when you go and wash your hands i don't know so I think it doesn't have to be anything major where you go on, even though I love the idea of going for a hike. But that, I mean, that's kind of what I did my research on is like recalibrating yourself. And I think we really have to recalibrate ourselves like all day long in different ways. But if we don't even notice we need to be recalibrated or right. regrouped or rebalanced, however you want to term right. it, um, then by the time we get to like bedtime and we can't go to sleep, it's because we're so revved up. We've accumulated all this stuff from days or uh, I don't know, maybe even just that day. Right. But that idea of doing something that is mindful and brings you back into the moment. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling the water running over your hands, Mm -hmm. that's that can be a mindfulness practice right there. Mm -hmm. Washing the dishes. We're looking out the window (laughs) at nature. You know, I mean, if you can't go for a hike, I think there's so much, you know, even if you look out your window, there's something, even if it's the sky, a cloud, a leaf on a tree, you know, those are all really beautiful things that you can fill yourself up with just to kind of rebalance yourself. Absolutely. And we can teach kids to do this, too, for themselves. Right. And what a tool. It's a you great know? tool. I just was at a school today teaching kids, and I always tell them, you know, this is a really important gift for you, like to give yourself, so you can learn how to deal with stress. And, they, and I actually played a very advanced, like, little mini piece of the beginning of a meditation, because I, and it was so interesting. They were totally entranced. I think kids really want to know this information. Absolutely. So. I was doing this with four and five-year-olds this morning um, in my younger kid class that I teach. And, yeah, they were doing it, you yeah. know. And, you know, they have even a thing on Sesame Street about, you know, breathe and slow down, do yeah. belly breathing, you yeah. know. And then think, not just feeling. <laughs> yeah. You know, get those higher functions back online. You know, and then, you know, it's just all these things that kids can learn very simply that are they are a big gift but breathing is a great simple tool um i think you know just to kind of it, it gets your blood kind of cleansed your you know refreshes you um it gets your attention reset it just kind of gets you re like gets your mind not so consumed by whatever it is you know that you're consumed by um i was just wondering and we have just t- probably time for like one maybe one more two more questions but i was wondering um if you heard any campaigns or, I mean, I know you have an organization that works specifically toward couples and family relations, but that works toward reducing mental health stigma, like toward talking about couples and family mm-hmm. relations. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a couple campaigns that um, that I know of. One is the Be the One campaign, which is a uh, to de- destigmatize mental health issues and things around mental illness and suicide. Mm-hmm. And be the one is the idea that you could be the one to be there for somebody. Nice. And this is on our national suicide lifeline. So if you Google national, the, the, if you Google lifeline, it will come up. Um, it's our national suicide prevention lifeline. Their one, their number is 1-800-273-TALK. But they have a whole Be the One campaign um, about how you can help somebody who's in crisis. Um, and it walks you through the steps really simply, but really trying to destigmatize mental health. Uh, there's a website called uh, Live Through This, which is about people who've made suicide attempts. And it has their portraits that are taken by the person who founded the website, um, Desiree Stage, who is a survivor herself. And um, it also has their stories. And you can hear the stories of people who at one point were so low they wanted to take their own life or made an attempt, but they now have lives of meaning for them. And if you want Anthony Rodriguez, who I know you work with as well, he's on, if you want to listen to his story, um, he came on and shared that and it's on iTunes and it's under the Dr. Deborah show. But I mean, I think that's great, you know, just so you don't feel so alone too, to know that, you know, there's other people that have been in that same predicament and, and they've, you know, there's hope. Yeah. 
And the National you know, Alliance for the Mentally Ill, NAMI, has a lot of anti-stigma campaigns because, you know, you don't get stigmatized for having, you know, physical health problems, although some people do feel like it's a stigma and they don't want to disclose that either. And cancer used to be like that. It can almost like it was contagious right. or something, right. you know, but I think now we can talk about having cancer without usually feeling shame. But I think, you know, with mental health issues, we're not there yet. And we should be because all people deal with mental health issues. And the statistics are that in our lifetime, we're going to come across these, yeah. you know, and so are the people we love. And so, you know, I don't think it's my I think we will. I mean, actually, you know, Time Mag, do you do you see those special Time Magazine? I yeah, this every time. But I do like them because they're nice and comprehensive. Yeah. I had one last year on mindfulness meditation. This year, it's all mental health. And I love I mean, the verbiage isn't exactly right. But the, on the back, it says that every person at some point in their lifetime will have a mental illness. I like the word mental health issues, I guess. But, yes. you know, I mean, so we're not immune from it. But I mean, I think that we have to be honest about that, too. That Absolutely. we are all in this together. I like what the Dalai Lama says, too, that we're all breathing in the same air. So we're here together. And I think, you know, we can support each other and we need each other, too. Yeah, we do. And the more connected and more community we feel like we have, the more the better we're going to deal with those things when they, we come across them. But not if we isolate ourselves when we're struggling.